I've been real <clears throat> perplexed as I've been considering today's lesson for quite a while and as I think about the death of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus and what he must have experienced in that process. Jan and I watched a movie Friday night and then I read a book yesterday. Yes, in one day. It was a short book and it was a large print. And it didn't have any pictures. Well, it did have pictures in the middle, but um, Heaven is for Real. Let me see the hands of those who read the book, Heaven is for Real. Okay, how many of you saw the movie, Heaven is for Real? Several have said that that movie and that book helped them to be more persuaded that heaven is real. And I can see why. I mean, there seems to be a lot of evidence for a four-year-old boy to talk about the experiences that he had in this heaven experience. And, but I, I certainly am not going to preach on this boy's testimony except to say that kid had a lot of experiences that are unexplainable. I wouldn't build my faith on his experience. I would build my faith on the experience of Jesus going to the cross and being raised from the dead and the fact that he's alive now. But there are several who have reported on their journey to heaven or their near-death experience or their entrance into... In fact, the Apostle Paul talked about his time going into the heavens. And he said, whether or not I was dead or not, I don't know, but I know this... I cannot tell you in words, I have no vocabulary to express to you what I experienced there. And then he also said, to keep me from becoming too inflated in my mind, God sent a messenger from Satan to humble me, to buffet me, to make me be a thorn in the flesh. And I prayed three times that he would remove this, but he each time said, no, and my grace is sufficient for you, because when you're weak, then I'm strong. And Thinking, upon what testimony do you build your faith? On a four-year-old boy's experience? On the eyewitness accounts of the followers of Jesus who saw him die and was raised from the dead? We have this eyewitness account in John chapter 11 of Jesus raising a man from the dead. I saw that happen yesterday as Jesus raised a woman from the dead who made her own funeral arrangements. I believe that there are a lot of of things about death and dying that will remain a mystery for us until we actually go through the process. And because we have not done that physically, there's sort of a, a feeling of apprehension as we face death. But Jesus, in his death and resurrection, has taken away the fear of dying. I love these two things about the story of the little boy, Colton Burpo, and his operation, his experience of what he claims to have gone into heaven and seen all that he saw. One of them is that his dad had stopped him from running into the street, and he pointed to a dead animal, and he said, look, that rabbit tried to make it across the street, and it didn't make it. It was run over and it was killed. Do you want that to happen to you? And he said, oh, good, then I can go back to heaven. And he said, how do you still fear in a boy who is not afraid to die? And I thought, boy, now there's a powerful message there for us. How, or what is it that we have to be afraid of if we ourselves are not afraid to die? You strip away the fear of death and you'll do anything. Because what's the ultimate somebody can do to you to stop you from doing something? You know, I brought you into this world. I can take you out of this world. Fine. I'm ready to go. You know, what fear is there that you would ever face that you couldn't go through if you're not even afraid to die? And so it is that the early Christians went out into the world and were threatened. And the apostles said in the face of threats, Go ahead, give us your worst. I mean, we're not, we're not afraid to die. You, you have to decide which is better, to obey God or to obey man. 
But whether or not you do these things to us, we're going to continue to proclaim what we have both seen and heard. So it doesn't matter what you do to us. And they would go through beatings and sufferings of all kinds because they weren't afraid to die. And if you're not afraid to die, you'll put yourself into situations that are inherently difficult and fear-producing, but you yourself will not be afraid because the ultimate fear has been removed. Before I read any further in John chapter 11, I want you to see in Hebrews chapter 2 a gift that Jesus gave us at the death and resurrection. Then we'll go come back to John 11. John chapter 2, he says, we'll start in verse 10, it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them, the ones he sanctified, brothers, saying, I will tell your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will... I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, Behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook in the same things. Pause. Jesus had to become a human being in order to go through what he went through. He could not have gone through what he went through and remained who he was, God. He had to become a human being. And so, so that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now watch. And deliver all those through fear of death, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not to the angels he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. That would be us. Not the physical offspring, but the faith offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That is, he was a sacrifice that took the heat off of us, the wrath of God off of us onto himself. Propitiation. For he, for because he himself has suffered When tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. It is because he took on a body, because he died on a cross, and because he was raised from the dead, he has released from the fear of death those of us who were trapped, afraid to die. And people who are afraid to die are also afraid to live. If you're not afraid to die, you will live to the fullest. And so he set us free from the fear of death that kept us as slaves. You do not have to fear shaking hands with the undertaker. And though he will tell you he'll be the last man to ever let you down, Jesus is the first man to raise you up. And so it is in John chapter 11 when Lazarus they deliberately stayed away from two day, for two more days. And when Jesus arrives... Here are the conversations that took place with the sisters of Lazarus. Verse 17 of John chapter 11. Are you there with me? Do you have your Bibles? Do you see your Bibles? Do I have them? I don't need my Bible. You got it up on the screen. Get your Bible. All right. (laughs) Hold up your phone, your iPad, tablet. Now, when Jesus came... He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brothers. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Pause just a moment. Martha is not expressing to Jesus, I know that if you were to call Lazarus from the dead, he would come back from the dead. 
furthest thing from her mind. That is a stretch of faith that she does not have at this point. That's not what she's saying here. What she's saying is, even though you disappointed me this way, I still have trust in you. I still believe you can do whatever you want. Okay, so that's what makes sense in this passage. She's telling him, if you'd only been here in time, you could have kept him from dying. I really believe that, Lord. And even now, I believe that you can still do anything you want to do. But as far as grasping that he can raise somebody from the dead who's been dead for four days, not in her mind. It is not on her radar screen. She cannot imagine that. And so she said those things. And so she said... But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And this is what leads me to believe that she does not know what Jesus is about to do, nor does it even enter her mind that he could do what he's about to do. Martha says, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection. On that day, Jesus said to her, say these words with me. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now take the word me out and put the word I in the next question. Do I believe this? Do you? Do you really believe that? Jesus asked, Martha, do you believe me? And she said, oh, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. The central testimony of the Gospel of John is this phrase. You are the Christ who's coming into the world. I put all of my hope in you. I believe that anyone who continues to trust you, even though he dies, he's going to live again. I believe that, Lord. But she's about to have her belief become reality right in front of her eyes. Okay, so when she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher's here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went out to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise and go out, he, and they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see the most often quoted scripture, especially when demanded, quote a Bible verse. Around our table, it was quote a Bible verse. And inevitably, one of the kids would say, Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. But the power of this one statement, I want you to kind of feel. As he saw Mary and Martha, he saw the Jewish consolers, mourners. Jesus was deeply moved. Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them says, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Funny, so far three statements John has made. We ought to pay attention to this. If John's written it three times in the same page, we ought to notice it. Lord, if you'd only been here. Lord, if you'd only been here. Couldn't he have? So three times we hear the statement, he could have healed the man question. He stayed away two days. Could he have made it in time to heal Lazarus? Would it have brought glory to God? Absolutely. 
He could have done that, but he chose not to. And the question now becomes, why? Jesus deeply moved again. Do you notice that? Three times we're, we're, we see the emotion expressed about Jesus at this occasion. Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone laid against it. Very similar to the place where Jesus himself, his body would be laid. Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha argued with him. (laughs) Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been dead for four days. I like the King James Version better. Lord, behold, he's been dead for four days. Behold, he stinketh. I've often felt that about some people I know. (laughs) Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Second part of John's message. Do you remember what he said in John chapter 1? Let me refresh your memory. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him and nothing was made that was not made without him. And in him was life. And the life was a light. And he enlightens all people who are coming into the world. John chapter 1 verse 14 And the Word became, ooh, there we are again, the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us, He tabernacled among us, and we beheld His glory. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only one begotten of God. John's gospel is a glory book. And you open up the pages of this book and you read through the events and interactions of Jesus, you see glory from God. But what do you see in the glory of God? Not just the power expressed, but the fact that the God of heaven is weeping with people. That the God of heaven is experiencing the weakness of people. That the God of heaven, who is all-powerful, majestic, holy, becomes our servant. And He, as our servant, has called us to become servants of each other. He, as our servant, who experienced our frailties, weaknesses, and He experienced our emotions, calls us to do the same with each other. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. He calls us to do what it is that he lived, and there's nothing that he's calling us to live that he himself has not done. So he is doing these things for us and through us. Are you with me so far? Trekking this? Okay. So there he is at the tomb, and he says, roll the stone away, and Martha argues with him, and he says, didn't I tell you if you only believe you're going to see the glory of God? Part two of the thesis of this book. Now we're back. I've made full circle, and are you with me? And he says, John chapter 11. And so they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and here's what he prayed. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around so that they may believe that you sent me. Pause a moment. This prayer is a preaching prayer. This is not just a prayer of Jesus heart to heart with God. Jesus is praying in public, so that others can learn a lesson in the similar way that he prayed in John chapter 17, and he defines eternal life. And this is eternal life, as if God needs a definition of eternal life. God doesn't need the definition. The people listening need the definition. So Jesus is actually teaching through a prayer to to God. This conversation he's having with Father, they're listening in on, and he's letting them know this one thing. This is not just me doing this. 
This is God at work through me. I know that you have heard me. You always listen to me. The only reason I'm praying now is because they need to know that you're the one who sent me. Then he said in a very loud voice, what? Lazarus! Gotcha. I have never seen someone jump that high while I'm preaching. That was cool. Lazarus, come forth! Somebody suggested if he hadn't called out by name and all he said was, come forth, all of the dead would have raised. <laughs> he had to call him by name. Now, step into the eternal with me for just a moment. And how long has Lazarus been there? Okay, four, four of our days. But a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. I'm assuming that time stops after we die. To the individual, there is not an experience of time. He has stepped into the eternal in the presence of God. Whew, what is he experiencing right now? Well, beautiful rainbow, according to Colton Burpo. I mean, yeah, colors beyond our imagination. This little girl that lives in Idaho that painted the picture of Jesus, that he said, that's him. She says, there are millions of colors we have yet to discover that are in heaven. And there's the rainbow that is around the throne of God. That's a Christian symbol we need to claim back. The rainbow was never intended to be that of pride in sin. And so this rainbow around the throne of God, this colorful, beautiful experience, Lazarus is having the time of, well, he's having the time of his life. And this is phenomenal. And he hears in the distance, Lazarus, Lazarus. Jesus said in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And suddenly inside the tomb, you start hearing this. He's been, going, he'd been dead for a while and his muscles are just. Can you hear the sound of his capillaries and his muscles and the blood flowing and everything kind of coming? That's what it sounds like. As he's being raised from the dead, all this is coming back. And then he gets up and starts walking out. Anybody seen the movie Mummy? The Mummy Rises, right? And he's all wrapped up in these garments and he's, uh, and he's coming out. Of the, and you're standing at the graveside and you're hearing and watching all of this. And you see Lazarus, who you know has been dead for four days. You're standing outside the tomb. The stone's been rolled away. And you know he's dead because you can smell it. Behold, and here he comes out, wrapped up. And Jesus says these words about that. Unwrap him. <laughs> Man who died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him, let him go. Whoa. And Lazarus. I imagine with a conversation later saying, why? Why did you call me back? It's so much better there. What? The key reason. Did I not tell you, if you believed, you would see the glory of God? We've said from the very beginning of our journey, whatever God takes us through with respect to Jan and the cancer that she's experiencing, all would be to her, all would be through her, through us, to God's glory. And that is the goal because he's still expressing his glory through his church. And that's who we are, right? And so what is it that God's going to do through you to take you through whatever in order to experience and express his glory? For Lazarus, it was a sickness and a death that were, ended up in his resurrection that ended up in his death. He's not still alive. Oh, but wait, hold it, wait. Yes, he is. He is still alive. Because anybody who believes in Jesus, though he dies, yet he will Live, and those who live and believe in Jesus will never die. Now, how is that? Well, that is this way. I've been thinking about how can I illustrate this in a way that might be helpful for us.
And I have two or three illustrations here that I hope will communicate to you clearly. This is not an advertisement for Kingsford charcoal. <laughs> I feel like Vanna White. <laughs> or a model of some kind here. Um, the packaging is, is attractive. It's, it's charcoal. When I went in, I was looking at various packages and charcoal, and there were two things that attracted me to this. The first one was the price, and the second one was the, the packaging. It's, it's attractive. But I didn't buy this for the package. I bought this for what's with me inside. And what's inside is the charcoal that can be useful. Okay, I'm looking at you, and I'm seeing eh, fairly attractive packaging, some of you. <laughs> some of you have still some work to do. Okay, but it's just so the, the packaging, and we put so much time on the packaging, on the outside. You know, you put on the makeup, you comb the hair, you cut the hair, you let it grow. You do, and, and, and the packaging is, is important to us. I mean, we are people that live in a body. But it, you just realize, you've got to know, it's just the package. I go to a funeral, and I'm looking at the, the body in the casket, and quite honestly, I, there's so much attention placed on the body, I'm confused sometimes, and, and I, I feel like maybe we're putting way too much emphasis on a body, on, on, on the package, and not on what's on the inside. And I, I look at the package, at the tent, at the temporary dwelling place that each of us live in, and I'm looking at you, and I'm saying, okay, so the package may not be exactly as we would like it to be. As you look at it, you're saying, wow, things have changed in my packaging. Yeah? But you, the real you, that lives inside that body, that's what's most important, is what's inside, not outside. And if you'll let me take this metaphor just a little bit further, the charcoal in here, the usefulness of it is that it'll burn up. It'll be used, and by the brightness and by the warmth, will provide a service. And I'm looking at packages of charcoal, and I think our prayer should be this. God, burn me up. Use me up. Make me glow. Make me warm. Make me useful. But you... Inside that package, you are beautiful. And we see, we see the outside and we're stuck on the outside, but there's a passage of Scripture that now comes to life. And it has to do with the physical nature of Jesus and the spiritual nature of Jesus and how at one time we saw that, but now we know it any longer. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is the passage I'm wanting you to turn to. Real quickly, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians, it will make a difference if we're turning to second and not first. And starting in verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others, but what we are is known to God and I hope it is known to you also your conscience. We are not committing ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast on the outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, and if we're in our right mind, it's for you. I'm crazy for Jesus, but I'm trying to be sane for you. For the love of Christ controls, one translation says, compels us, because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, so that those who live may no longer live for themselves, but, all, but for him who for their sake died, but we're not stopping there. He was raised. Watch this. 
For now on, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We no longer look at each other as just physical bodies and treat each other accordingly. I'm trapped in this physical body. You're trapped in that physical body. And what happens to our body as we age is inevitable. It's going to happen if we age. <laughs> it's going to happen. Am I right? Those of you who have aged longer than I and all of the others here, well, we put so much emphasis on the outside. And we judge each other on the outside. But Jesus said, no, it's on the inside. It's that which is on the inside. So Lazarus' body was placed in the tomb. Lazarus' body was wrapped up in gravestone. Lazarus' body was already in the process of decay. Where was Lazarus? He wasn't dead, but his body was laying there. There's a difference between the body and the person. I tried to communicate that once in the very first funeral I ever preached. True story. About my 23, 24 years old. <laughs> and the preacher of our church was called away for a weekend. And he was asked to do a funeral of somebody that he didn't know. He just knew that the man was not a Christian. And he agreed to do the funeral because he saw it as an outreach opportunity. But now all of a sudden he was called out of town. And, Kevin, you need to fill in for me. I'm a campus minister at the time. I've never done a funeral in my life. So I'm standing there first time at this casket. And I pointed at the casket. And I said to the people present, Joe is not really dead. And this is not Joe. I mean, eyes... Eyes opened wide, jaws dropped. A couple people started crying when I said, this isn't Joe. And, and it was really an interesting experience because I thought, I saw their response and I lost what I wanted to say. I had no clue what to say. And, and what do you say that's going to give comfort to somebody about the hope of the resurrection that's in Christ when this person died and wasn't in Christ? And this is my first time. So it's my first time, and it's a man that's not a Christian, and what am I supposed to say to give hope? And all that Gaston had told me was, tell him about Jesus. So I thought my, my entrance into Jesus was, this is just a body. This is not Joe. But this is totally foreign to nearly everyone who was there. They had no clue what I was talking about. You have a clue, because you've read your Bible Many of you. Some of you, this is the first time you've heard this. Listen carefully. This is not me. This body. I live inside this body. One day, this body is going to die and go back to the ground from which it was made. And I, the real me, I'm going to live on. Now, where are you going to go? I'm planning to go home. Where are you going to go? I'm going to go to Father. The one phrase that came from heaven is real is this. That I love this little boy. Four-year-old boy said... And expressing, why did Jesus die on the cross? And he says, I know why. Jesus told me to bring people home to his dad. And he said, of all the Christological arguments and theological statements, he boiled it down to a very simple statement. Jesus said, I want to take you home so you can be with my dad. No matter what I say this morning, some of you are not going to accept this. You've, you have set your mind on, I am not about to surrender myself to Jesus. And you're going to miss it. He came so that you could go home with him to be with his dad. Better yet, he came so that he could change you on the inside, make you one of his. You're part of his family. And the dad of Jesus has now become your dad. Mm, I love that. I love that. Many of you are more like this. This looks good. It was a gift to me. The only problem is nothing there. 
Nothing on the inside. At least there's something on the inside. And I'm thinking how empty people are and how when Jesus died and was raised from the dead, what does he promise? I'll fill you with my spirit. I'll make you alive. I will, I will put something on the inside that is not there. And in this case, I would like to be full of hot coffee. But in your case, I'd love you to be seeing, I'd love to see you filled with the Holy Spirit of God. This is not full like I'd like to see it full. And this is not a request, but, you know, if you're so moved. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I want something on the inside that's not there naturally. And what I want on the inside is the spirit of Jesus himself so that I can handle life. I can experience the joys to the greatest degree possible and I can handle the, the pains and the difficulties and failures and suffering like no one else in the world can. Here. Death is not the final event. It's a transitional event. And if we could only see what's on the other side. To the, to the caterpillar, the cocoon is the end. To the butterfly, the cocoon is the beginning. To the world, death is the end. To the Christian, the grave is the beginning. That's the message of hope. And it's not because a little boy saw heaven. It's because of Jesus of heaven entered our world to take us home to be with his dad. Pray with me. Lord, as I conclude this message, I pray that you will drive into our hearts the depth of love that you have for us. Jesus, that you would cry at a graveside is so meaningful. but that you would yourself taste and experience our death and our sin and our rebellion and take that in yourself and die. And you've experienced the resurrection power and the work of the Spirit to bring you to life. And in you we place our hope. You, Jesus, are our all in all. You're everything to us. Help us to live like it. Help us to respond to you like Tiffany has if we need to. I pray that you will place in the hearts of those who have not been baptized that today will be the day that they begin their walk with you and accept from you forgiveness in your spirit. But in each of our cases, renew. Renew and refresh our faith. Restore our hope. Give us the joy that is there because you have saved and are saving us. And it's in your name and to your glory that we will praise these things. Amen. Let's stand and sing, guys.